So, tip number one, under promise, over deliver. So this is a very, very common mistake that happens to a lot of new and sometimes even experienced engineers. If you look at the projects that are delivered late or over time, you'll be surprised at what that number is. I think it's some staggering number, like 50% of all projects. Now if you think about that for a little bit, it sounds kind of crazy. 50% of software projects are delivered late or over budget. That is just mind boggling to me. For personal story, so I recall distinctly when I was first out of college and then I was working at a startup and I was given a project to lead as a tech lead. So I was responsible for feature development, took about six weeks at the end of it. My manager at the time sat me down and told me this advice that I would carry throughout my entire life. So he said, always under promise, over deliver. And what that means is to be conservative with your estimations, over deliver on the results. You wanna provide some buffer in your estimations because a lot of things can go wrong. So some of the benefits of under promising and over delivery is that first, it gives you ample time to prepare. So you can take the time to refactor, take the time to really go through your code and figure out what is the best design for you. The second thing is it allows you time to go back and figure out what is the best design for your specific scenario and not just a working design because a bad design is gonna stay with you for the length of the entire project. And then as scope grows bigger and bigger, a simple line of code that you wrote that was a hack to get a project to ship is going to bite you in the butt. Number three is a lot of things can go wrong during feature development time. You know, things like getting sick, your parents are in town, uh, some of your coworkers are on vacation, stuff like that, your kids get sick. So this is the one I really like. So because of the above two points, which is taking time to deliver the best design for your work, and number three, providing ample schedule for your project to reach completion, now enables people to look at you and see you're a consistent all-star performer who can produce high quality work on time, on schedule, on budget. So that would just make you look like an all-star performer in the company. So I know what you're thinking. So this might be something that's going on in your head. So you might argue that the downside of under-promising makes people think that you're being lazy. Otherwise, why would you give a cost of 10 weeks for a project that you can complete in two, right? So that's the same exact thing that I struggled with for a long time as well. So initially starting out, I was thinking that what would other people think of me if they know that a project can be completed in two weeks and I told them it would take 10. Now, the thing to remember here is, you are the tech lead, so you are responsible for delivering that feature. What that means also is that people trust you to give the right estimation and for your current circumstance. So people trust your expertise to provide a schedule, a realistic schedule that everyone can hit on time, on budget. So the little trick I can give you here is that as long as you stay consistent, and you have an open communication with all the stakeholders in the project, you'll probably be fine. So my second tip for being a successful software engineer is perfect is the enemy of good. As a software engineer, you've probably heard of this story. You look at the project and you think that, oh, I probably can't ship this project right now, it needs that and it needs this, and then I need to have all these different features done before I can ship it. And then what happens is you start diving into this, you pull up your sleeves, right? And you start looking into what you need to get that project out the door. Two hours later. I haven't done anything. So perfect is the enemy of good. It comes from our education from young, where we're expected to give homework that is perfect or complete. Now, in life, a lot of the situation is you're not gonna be able to provide something that is complete or perfect. It simply does not exist. Every decision that you make in either software engineering or in life or in work, you know, a lot of different areas that you think of, a lot of your decisions are actually trade-offs. Now, you might or might not be aware of the various different alternatives to your decision, but there are definitely trade-offs. So whenever you're making a decision, you should think of various different alternatives and recognize several things. You should recognize that you don't know every single possible alternative out there. That is something that you just have to be aware of and accept. It just happens to everyone, right? So the key learning here is accept that you don't know every single possible alternative out there. In light of that number one learning, you want to collect as much information possible 
without making a decision first. So delay your decision making as long as possible until you've collected all the information that you think you need to make that right decision. There's no one perfect decision where once you make it, it's gonna solve all the problems ahead of you. It doesn't work that way. Life is sort of like a cycle. You meet a problem, you collect information, you solve it, execute on it, move on, until you, until you meet the next problem, then you go through the entire process again. So as long as you stay consistent throughout that process, you're gonna be totally fine. Advice number three, staying on path. So feature creep is one of the natural counter example to this advice. So if you think about feature creep, what is feature creep? Feature creep is that you're working on a project. You start thinking that, hey, I need to have X, Y, and Z in my project in order to get people to use it. They're not gonna want to use my project if I don't have these criteria, if I don't have these features. And you start to realize that all this stuff are actually happening just in your mind. And no one actually cares about what you think. This is the cruelty of the world. No one really cares about what you think. You have to get something in their hands, collect feedback, and then move on. That's how it works. People tend to be selfish creatures. I kind of feel a little bit bad about saying that, but it's true. Most people care about what can you do? What can you provide value for them? And that's something you have to recognize. As you go out into, into a world and you start working, you have to realize that people only care about what value you can bring to the table and not what you think you bring to the table. So my advice for getting through feature creep and staying on course is one, stay focused. Set up a goal at the start of your project. Make sure you've thought through every single thing that you want to build and what are some things that you don't want to build and stick to it. Make a plan for it, make a schedule for your project and then make sure you hit mouse. So we humans love instant gratification. We want to see our projects bearing fruit. If you can release something in two weeks, by all means, go for it. Don't extend out the project unnecessarily because you think it's kind of nice to have feature A1, A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3. Don't ever do that. Or figure out what's the minimum set of features that you need in order to satisfy a requirement and then go for it and build that, okay? Ship that project, get people to use it, collect feedback, and then improve again. So that kind of ties back into my next point, which is collecting feedback early. Every time you make a decision, there are various other alternatives or opportunities that you could have pursued otherwise. So what I'm trying to get at is, before you make a decision, you need to collect as much information as possible, evaluate the risks, the upside and the downside associated with the, each decision, and then make your decision and then move on. What is considered a good or bad decision? A good decision is something where I know exactly what the upside are and I'm okay with the risk involved in there. So every single decision sort of looks like that, right? There's no one decision where there are absolutely no downsides, only upside. So you'll eventually make a decision that will be best for your specific scenario and one that best fits your goal. There's no one objectively good decision. There's no one objectively best decision that works for everyone. There's no one size fit all decision, right? Eventually you'll get to that point where you have to figure out what works for you, what aligns with your goals and best interests and career growth, and then you will make that decision. That is the best decision for you. So the framework for solving a problem for me is that I assign the probability of the worst case scenario for each different path that I can take. And then I evaluate what, are, what is the probability if the probability of things going wrong is statistically significant, then I will do two things. One, I find a different alternative where the probability of things going very, very wrong is very, very low. Two, I find ways to mitigate risk in my current path such that the probability of things going wrong is no longer statistically significant. And then once I'm done with that, I make that decision, I move on, and then the next problem comes up again, I apply the same framework for solving that problem. It's equally important to note that releasing early and releasing often doesn't mean releasing a broken product. A broken product is simply not useful for anyone and it's just being disrespectful to your users. And one thing I highly recommend is that when you release early and release often, it doesn't mean that you have to release your product to every single user out there. You can consider segmenting your users into several smaller groups and then release your product to a smaller subset of them so that they can test it out and give you feedback 
And in the worst case scenario, if you mess up, at least all your other users don't know about it yet and then you have time to fix it. So my next tip is seek before you ask. And I see this happening with a lot of younger or newer software engineers is that when they see a problem that they've never seen before or never encountered before, the first thing they do is they ask a senior engineer how they solve it. And the reason I don't highly recommend that is because you should probably try to dive deep into that problem space before asking someone else for help. And the benefits are kind of twofold here. The first thing is allowing Deep diving into a problem allows you the opportunity to explore a different code base or a different problem space that you've never actually seen before. So that's good just for your overall career growth. It lets you understand that what other people are doing and how they're doing it. As you mature as a software engineer, people will come to you for advice and help on things that they're not sure about. And as a software engineer, you might not know every single thing out there and it is your responsibility as you grow to help these people explore those spaces and get them to safe ground. My other tip is optimize for simplicity. So always strive for simplicity in your life, in either work or just regular life. So both of those. Oftentimes I'll see a junior software engineer use interface, abstraction, uh, and complex and interesting frameworks in their projects. Now those are good things to have, but the problem there is it adds additional complication when they didn't need to in the first place. And as you mature as a software engineer, you'll start to realize that writing code is not just a matter of optimizing for performance, but you're also optimizing for people. And that is where code organization and code readability comes into place. Because when you write new code, the people who maintain it might not necessarily be the same people who wrote it in the first place. So when you're onboarding new engineers, that's something you should take into account as well. And I believe that simplicity extends well into your regular life as well. Reduce the number of physical possessions that you have, cut down the clutter in your life, reduce, reduce, reduce. That's super, super important. Uh, I see a lot of younger engineers, you know, once they make some money, they start getting to like car, car loans, mortgages, a fancy vacation, fancy clothes, and you know, all that stuff. Those are not necessarily things that you need in order to make your life better. So I highly recommend that you kind of keep that in mind as you move on as a software engineer, and I hope you're the best in the road of becoming successful. So those are some of my tips to be a successful software engineer. If you like this video, please leave a comment on what is your number one problem as a software engineer. Leave them in the comments below and I will answer them. And remember as always, if you like this video, click to subscribe, hit the bell button, and then I'll see you in the next video. See ya.